Listen carefully. The Martians are coming this way. It's a 1950s science fiction film about an alien invasion, which of course in no way narrows down the possibilities. However, this is a really good one. This type of defense is useless against that kind of power. It is the alien invasion movie that all other alien invasion movies want to cosplay as at conventions. The Martians have turned up to your party uninvited in The War of the Worlds. Do you have a pocket compass? Yeah. Hey, that needle isn't pointing north. H.G. Wells' The War of the Worlds appeared serialized in magazines before being published as a full novel in 1898. He told the story of an unnamed narrator and his brother watching as aliens from Mars lay waste to Victorian Britain with their three-legged war machines. Is that some kind of a flying machine? No, no. It's supported from the ground by rays, probably some form of magnetic flux like invisible legs. For a long time, science fiction and fantasy writers sure loved Mars, imagining all sorts of things humans would find there. It was close to Earth, and for a long time, people assumed there must be some form of intelligent life there. But then they said the same thing about Essex. It's 1953, and the inhabitants of a small town in California witness what they believe is a meteor strike. The local authorities ask some fishing scientists if they'd take a look. Now, to clarify, they were just the scientists who happened to be fishing nearby, not scientists who were in any way involved in studies looking at improving the processing of frozen seafood. Dr. Clayton Forrester is first on the scene. Forrester's the man behind the new atomic engines. They had him on the cover of Time. You know, you've got to rate to get that. Nah, he isn't that good. Where he bumps into local woman Sylvia Van Buren. As the meteor was too hot to examine, it was number three on Triple J's Hot 100 Meteors, the pair instead go to a square dance in town. If we could gather all the energy expended in just one square dance, we could send that meteor back to where it came from. Now, this is in no way foreshadowing anything, since dance numbers will not prove crucial to the film's plot. They just like square dances. The meteor seems to be opening up, and the three locals deputized to keep watch decide to initiate first contact. Where'd you think they come from? How would I know? It's someplace. Mars is near the Earth right now. Part of an alien machine appears, which the aliens have developed as the perfect antidote to unwanted first contact. We're friends! Yeah! Things take a turn, and so historians should take note. The turning point for humanity in this affair, the square dance. The alien machine reveals itself fully, and it's really not in the mood for much of anything other than destroying whatever pops up. The army shows up, but the military technology of the 50s proves to be about as threatening to the alien machines as a ping pong ball is to the hull of the Nautilus. Forrester and Anne take refuge in an abandoned house, where they try to recover from their ordeal. But they seem to murder everything that moves. If they're mortal, they must have mortal weaknesses. Just then, another alien cylinder lands on top of them, which is either a lousy park or worth 50 points. The pair manage to knock off the head of an alien probe, while an actual alien exits the craft to investigate. Forrester and Anne will grow closer, as the film has them escaping together, getting lost, returning to the city before being separated, and then eventually finding each other. It's an age-old story, getting lost, escaping, getting separated, and being found again. Also, user reviews on this one are brutal. The film does do some things differently from any similar films of the era. Everybody understands when you wave the white flag, you want to be friends? The humans are open to friendship, but it's the aliens who ignore their friend requests. Anne's uncle, Pastor Matthew, makes one last effort to try and appeal to the aliens' better nature. Spoilers, they don't have one. We will see montage sequences of War Machines footage superimposed over newsreels to show aliens popping up around the world, undefeated by all who stand against them. I watched high-level bombers drop everything they carry. They were knocked out of the sky and their bombs did nothing. Nothing was effective against them. Apparently, though, Washington, D.C. is the only major capital to have avoided the aliens so far. Perhaps because even the aliens don't want to get stuck in beltway traffic. Of course, this being the 1950s, the military are confident of the ace up their sleeve. They're going to drop the atomic bomb. Well, you know, the bomb will do it. Nothing can stand up to the bomb. The bomb is great, etc. But the unspoken bit? If the atom bomb doesn't work, then they are seriously up shit creek without a paddle. They haven't even been touched! Guns, tanks, bombs, 
They're like toys against them. Now it's time to paddle. Paddle like you've never paddled before. Paddle with your hands and please paddle faster. Our best hope lies in what you people can develop to help us. No pressure. The scientists have made some important discoveries, but the city is being evacuated before the alien onslaught. Riots have broken out, either because of the Stanley Cup final or the alien invasion, I forget which. The scientists have been turfed out of their trucks by angry mobs and scattered all over the city. Forrester searches for Anne, who he remembers once hid in a church, and so he too searches places of worship. He finds her just as the aliens are advancing. And they've run out of places to run. The aliens are destroying everything when... Oh, the aliens had no resistance to Earth bacteria. Well, that was lucky. There had been several attempts to make a film version of War of the Worlds, going back to the mid-twenties when Cecil B. DeMille looked to make a silent version. Paramount had bought the film rights in perpetuity, though you'd have to think at the time everybody in the business thought they'd be lucky if they were still making movies ten years down the track. However, no War of the Worlds film was released. In 1938, Orson Welles and his Mercury Theatre Company produced an updated radio dramatization of The War of the Worlds, but one presented as a live news broadcast of an invasion starting on the east coast of the United States. Even with the occasional on-air reminder that this was a play, some folks panicked, thinking an actual invasion was happening, but apparently one where CBS had the exclusive broadcast rights only on CBS, the official broadcaster of the 1938 invasion of Earth. When Orson Welles was courted by Hollywood after his radio broadcast, a film version of War of the Worlds was first and foremost in the minds of studio executives at the time. Welles instead preferred to make his own project, Citizen Kane, which would ultimately prove to be both his making and his undoing as far as Hollywood went. Later on, Ray Harryhausen produced an effects test as part of a pitch to make a film version of War of the Worlds. But again, like the idea of an American cricket superstar, nothing eventuated. DeMille eventually allowed Paramount to hand over the production to another producer, with George Powell taking on the project. Powell had produced Puppetoons, a popular series of animated shorts, before branching out into live-action productions in the 50s, some of which were quite effects heavy. He'd later direct some of his own projects, but in the early 50s he would hire other directors to call the shots on his movies. Byron Haskin had directed several films, and had also worked in the special effects department at Warner Brothers. War of the Worlds would be the first of several films that Haskin would direct for Powell. Paramount had assumed they'd snaffled all of the film rights, but during production it was discovered that their rights were for silent movies only. The situation was quickly remedied with Wells Estate, but that could have been an awkward experience to release a three-strip Technicolor silent movie in the 50s. In the early 50s, colour was still reserved for big-budget films aimed at a mass market. Most films using colour used a three-strip Technicolor process, which was a very expensive effort that required a giant camera capturing a black and white image on one piece of film with the same frames captured on two more pieces of film filtered with red or blue filters. There were also two strip Technicolor systems and also the failed 52 strip Technicolor system invented by my mate Dickhead Dave, who truth be told was less of a film buff and more of a bankruptcy fetishist. H.G. Wells' novels were set in his day, the late 19th century, but producer George Powell felt audiences would better connect to something set in the then contemporary times. Also, it would be incredibly interesting to see how the latest military technology would stack up against aliens from Mars. Spoilers, it doesn't. In between the book's publication and the film's production, there had been two world wars and of course the invention of the atom bomb as the ultimate weapon to use against the aliens. Of course, even the A-bomb doesn't work. Or perhaps the Air Force got mixed up and instead of dropping an atom bomb, they dropped a five-ton bottle of talcum powder on the war machines. Either way, the long-term effects on the humans nearby would not be good. You mean by some biological approach? We know now that we can't beat their machines. We've got to beat them. The majority of the movie was filmed in the studio complex, especially if there was dialogue. Scenes were either shot on sound stages or shot on the studio backlot. Coincidentally, Uncle Reg was also once shot on the same backlot, but that was a beanie baby smuggling deal gone wrong. Some exteriors were filmed in Arizona, where the production had the cooperation of the army to help lend the production scale. Some other scenes were filmed in and around Los Angeles. The book The War of the Worlds famously had Martian war machines that moved via three legs. 
George Powell thought he could animate them, but the studio thought that that would be too expensive, and instead art director Al Nozaki designed the iconic and graceful vessels, based on the shape of a manta ray. The models for the film were made out of copper and flown on wires, lots of them. Nearly three quarters of the film's $2 million budget went towards special effects. Well, that money is all on the screen. There are very few effects that don't hold up. Sure, any film fan will probably be able to tell what's a travelling mat, what's optically composited, back projected, what's a miniature, what's a man in a suit, but it's almost all done so well that there is very little to criticise. The miniatures of Los Angeles streets used for the aliens' final assault, including the destruction of City Hall, are some of the best committed to film of any decade. There was a plan at one point to shoot at least parts of the film in 3D. The film was influential in that other type of effects, sound effects. Every sound of the Martian war machine is familiar to anybody who's enjoyed sci-fi television and cartoons for decades. Creating unusual sound effects sounds simple to some people, but we are talking about a time when magnetic tape was less than a decade old, programmable synthesizers were still in the future, and samplers hadn't even been a glint in the eye of the creators of the Fairlight. Oh, what's he like? Well, he's like, uh, like... Gene Barry would have a long career starring in films and many television series, but War of the Worlds has been one of his most enduring roles. Like so many starlets of the era, Anne Robinson was under contract to the studio, and she would also later reprise her role of Sylvia Van Buren in a 1980s War of the Worlds TV series. That's a long contract there. I'm free. The film was a massive success in its day, and for a generation would be a defining film of the genre and a definitive version of Wells' book. It would be nearly 25 years before another major retelling of the story grabbed the public's imagination. But then it would be as a concept double album LP. Jeff Wayne's War of the Worlds retold the original story as a musical, and the album would go on to sell more copies than a backstreet market selling Rolex watches for 50 bucks a piece. Paramount had toyed with a TV version in the late 70s as a potential part of their stalled plans for a fourth TV network. In 1988, however, Paramount would launch a syndicated War of the World series as a direct sequel to the 1953 movie. In 1953, we experienced what can only be described as a War of the Worlds. In the mid-90s, advances in FX technology had made films like Independence Day and Mars Attacks possible, both of which seem quite influenced by Wells' original story or this film. Paramount would also revisit the source material in 2005 when Steven Spielberg gave us his take on the novel. Now that the book is in public domain, anybody can make a version of Wells' novel, though not necessarily using designs of existing films. One day, I may launch my own version of War of the Worlds, starring Chris Pratt as the voice of the bacteria. Really? Now that is a cruel twist of fate. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below, or check out some of our other videos.